Well, good day and good afternoon to all of you joining us for the special World Urban Parks uh, webinar today with colleagues from across Latin America. As we let people enroll in, I'll be quiet for just a second, but if you're, if you're here for the webinar to hear about Latin America's innovations, uh, you are in the right place. So we'll give us a couple minutes just to let some other people tune in and then we'll begin the program. All right, well, I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, hola, como esta? Me llamo Scott Martin, uh, Estados Unidos, and that's the end of my Spanish. Apologies for me forgetting everything I learned in American high school. Um, we are very fortunate to have a great panel today of, of what I consider dear friends and a soon to be dear friend, I'm sure, um, that you're gonna enjoy hearing from. And these are, these are colleagues whose experiences I, I just treasure. Um, and I know they treasure sharing their stories with you as well. I can also say as the Kentuckian here, uh, Luis appreciates bourbon, so that makes him a kindred spirit with me uh, immediately. Um, just a quick intro before we get into this, uh, you're with World Urban Parks. If you're not familiar with our group, we are a young, emerging and growing, probably collaboration is the best idea to, to really think about us as, um, but we're a group of folks who've learned we share a hell of a lot in common. And just like COVID spread around the world globally at the blink of an eye, innovations in parks, challenges in parks, likewise spread around the world. And we have so much to learn from one another. And we're a group that genuinely loves getting together and sharing and learning and innovating and thinking together. If you would like to learn more, if this sounds up your alley, uh, I encourage you to visit our website, check out any of the social media platforms. We would love to have you join our community. Um, I personally find it to be the most inspirational group of folks I have ever encountered. Um, and I, I have a feeling you would feel likewise as well. So this is the team. Um, you may have run into some of these at different events. Jane Miller is our chair and president at present. Uh, Gil Penalosa, the ever excitable um, and inspiring Gil is our ambassador with a couple others that have joined him as well. And we're led ably by Neil McCarthy and Ben Jonah. So there are four countries represented there. This is a North American webinar, but a global audience. And if you are tuning in from North America, we would love to have you join it. Uh, this just gives you an idea of where some of the members in our committee are, are located and we would love to see this map grow. But this organization isn't about belonging to an organization or checking a box. This is all about exchanging ideas, um, asking for help and, and learning from one another. And that's what we're after. This is part of a series of webinars that we do throughout the year. We do about one or two a month. The next one will be later this month on May the 25th. Uh, our colleagues in Millennium Park are gonna be speaking about the connection between arts and parks. And as we like to think about, uh, every great park has a great soundtrack and, and has great art incorporated. And these folks are gonna be exploring how Chicago has really taken its music and its heritage and its arts and brought them together with its public parks. So if you're interested in that, in that intersection, please join us then. In the chat, I will go ahead and place the link so you can register for that as well. We'd love to have you join us. And all of this is made possible by our, our friends at Marmac, um, a new global platform to help you think about and analyze the work that you do in your parks, how well you're doing compared to your peers and your colleagues for metrics. And there's a lot more that can be found on this from this new emerging company in Canada, really exciting uh, frontline innovations about deploying technology to help us do a better job that crosses boundaries across the globe. So I encourage you to check out them and their work if you're interested in improving how you deliver your parks and how you stand up against your peers at rfam.ca. Um, so with that, I have the pleasure now of stopping my share screen and sharing it with my dear colleague and friend, AP from LA. AP will introduce our speakers today. And at, at the end of about an hour and 15, we'll wrap it up. AP, I will shut the heck up and thank you so much for taking time to facilitate and guide this discussion. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Gracias y bienvenidos a todos. Thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to kick off this webinar, which we're gonna do in just a quick second. 
Um, and really excited to be in discussion with all of you uh, from the Latin American perspective uh, and the intersection of the amazing, beautiful spaces that uh, Latin America is blessed with in terms of its country um, and its really vibrant uh, continents and countries and just the, it's just incredibly beautiful, but how that intersects with uh, having so many urban metropolises and so many people um, and really a great snapshot. I'm excited because we don't always get the Latin American perspective, but truly in Latin America, all of the issues of uh, equality, sustainability, resiliency um, can be uh, studied so well because there's so much going on in these amazing parts of the world. So we have uh, some panelists with us today, uh, two amazing colleagues, um, Luis and Herman from Mexico. And then Evelyn and Rodrigo will be uh, joining us uh, from Brazil. And together they will give some perspectives on uh, these very topics. Again, how we're using parks uh, to help facilitate uh, issues such as equality, um, access, uh, sustainability, resiliency, and uh, really sort of get us thinking. And so with that, we will get into the webinar and then at the end, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. We have other people monitoring those and we're happy to have a few discussions and I'll help facilitate that as we get towards the end of the pres uh, presentations. For, so for now, sit back, uh, enjoy, and let's go to Latin America. Gracias, Herman, Luis. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Scott. Thank you, AP and the Academy and of course the World Bank Parks to give us a chance to share with you as a matter of fact, some of the projects that you are uh, working with and promote in Latin America. Hola a todos, bienvenidos a todas y a todos. Vamos a compartir estas historias que ustedes han generado en América Latina y somos simplemente portavoces de ellas. Vamos a compartir la pantalla. Let's share the screen and start. Uh, Germán and I, uh, first of all, uh, before uh, Rodrigo and Evelyn, uh, had a chance to talk. We are going to share with you 11 successful stories in all over in Latin America, not just in Mexico, but in other parts. And we thank our uh, friends uh, who are working in these projects to share with us uh, all the information that we are going uh, to share with you. Well, the first uh, case is obviously one of the most important parks in Mexico. Uh, maybe the oldest is the Chapultepec Park, which is in the in Mexico City. It has pretty much a double size of Central Park, just to give you an, uh, a, a, a perspective about the size. And it has a, a lot of, you know, uh, uses and uh, promote a lot of uh, intentions uh, regarding the, the urban use, the, the urban and, and the public space use in Mexico City. Uh, this case is uh, related to the uh, economic, to the sustainability, and obviously to the public participation. And the Chapultepec Park has this uh, trust, it's a private trust, uh, who uh, collect money, uh, make a lot of campaigns regarding the fundraising, and collect pretty much, it's the pen of the year, but $2 million per year that uh, are used in the park to promote obviously uh, capital projects. And uh, this is leading by Lily Howard, which is also part of the World Bank Parks and it's part of the large parks committees. Uh, Chapultepec uh, won the gold award uh, from uh, World Bank Parks, I think two years ago. So it has been playing a key role in our uh, park system in Mexico as, as a major park. And uh, those, uh, projects that I'm showing your, in your screen is part of these uh, projects that are found by the trust and the, by the businessmen who are uh, leading this uh, initiative. And also the park since many, many years ago to start to promote the creation of employment and the promotion economy uh, among the visitors with options, not just uh, for uh, people who are allowed to buy a coffee from Starbucks or a book in this kind of library, but in many other uh, sectors of the population with products uh, in low prices and uh, I mean, many options to offer to them. 
Uh, Herman, your turn. Thank you very much, Luis. And uh, well, good day, good afternoon, good night, whatever you are. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. Um, I'll be, uh, we'll be passing the ball between Luis and I to talk about these amazing projects. And um, I, I also just wanted to say before I speak about this amazing uh, <clears throat> case study, which is La Mexicana, that Latin America has uh, a lot of challenges, as you may know. However, uh, we're going to be focusing in, uh, as AP said, in resilience, in terms of how to bounce back from adversity, in terms of how to create public space in cities where most of the time they were not planned to have public spaces. So uh, how to make the most out of uh, some circumstances and also security, which is one of the main concerns in Latin America, how to feel safe in a public space and what to do about it. There is a lot of creative uh, solutions and also sustainability. I mean, as Luis just mentioned in Chapultepec, they have this great, great uh, trust that they have been financing projects and that's a great example. I mean, all of us that we work in park management in Mexico, Latin America, Chapultepec Park has been a great example of how to, um, how to make citizens and the organized society in general, how to participate. That is not just the government that needs to take the decisions in terms of public spaces, that we all have a voice and we all can participate somehow. And La Mexicana Park, it's a great story about a beautiful circumstance. I mean, La Mexicana was a mine, a quarry, where uh, in the beginning where Mexico City was being built and well, it, it grew a lot. I mean, it's one of the large, it's the largest city in Latin America, but it, this space, which is quite, quite big, is 28, uh, almost like 40 hectares. Uh, it was designed as a mine. And then uh, overall in time, there was a lot of uh, population that decided to live there. And it became kind of a, a very well-developed area of Mexico City, which is called Santa Fe. You can see the buildings there where it's, it's a beautiful part of Mexico City. So this mine, this quarry, uh, it uh, in, back in, well, a few years ago, not that much uh, time ago, they decided to, to make it, uh, well, how to, how to rescue it. And Luis, feel free to to jump in because you know the story better than ever. Uh, but anyway, there was this great set of actors, uh, which they were citizens that they wanted a public space in that area. So anyway, what they decided before going just for uh, to transform this place and making buildings, they decided to make a great arrangement with uh, the government and to sell part of this land in order for housing development and the other part, the bigger part, 20 hec uh, 28 hectares, uh, to develop a park, but not just any park, an incredible, beautiful park, which uh, nowadays is quite a reference. Uh, it's, it's a reference of uh, park quality in Mexico. Uh, this, this park is La Mexicana. It's, uh, it got built in 2017, so it's actually quite quite new. And it has a very interesting model of concern of, of how to uh, sustain itself. Uh, it's managed by, by the neighbor association, by a private trust. And the way that it, it, gets, uh, it gets by is through concessions. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful park. I mean, then again, I'm not a tourist or trip advisor or agent or whatever, but you have to visit this park if you go to Mexico City. And if we do, I mean, check this picture. I mean, it's an incredibly designed park. It was designed by uh, the renowned architect, Mario Shedman. And it's very well thought of how uh, people can, can interact with nature in what was before a mine. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, this place was completely desolated. And now look at how beautiful it is. Tons of, uh, of people go there. I mean, more than 2 million people a year have been going there. It's a free of access park. Uh, it, it doesn't have an access fee. And uh, anyway, it's, it's great. And how does it sustain itself? Because this is the, the, one of the biggest challenge of, of park management in Latin America. How do we get money if the government won't invest in it? So concessions and a successful management of concession. This is a great strategy that our dear friend Itzier de Luisa, who is the, 
the well the head of all these i mean she's the the president of, of this uh, of this trust fund uh, she has been doing a great work in making these alliances a strategic alliances with not just any 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 store any commerce but they handpicked every single one of the of the commercial partners in order to establish her and the rents that they get because these are high quality establishments it's it's quite significant way more significant than uh, other parks in mexico for example so anyway, right now there is this Costco, you know, these retail stories is kind of a Walmart, but in a membership basis. Uh, anyway, uh, and through the rent, they have been able to manage this incredible park uh, and it's just the neighbors there. I mean, they also involve uh, in, the, in the board, uh, members of the government and some others like, for example, uh, headmasters of universities. But this, it is a great example of how to get by in a place that it was meant for something completely different, how to make a, one of the most beautiful parks in Latin America and make it self-sustainable, which is one of the biggest challenges, which uh, anyway left, leaves us with an example of uh, how we can make the most if uh, society gets together and they have a vision, a vision that can, turn, can, that can turn out to be this beautiful example that is La Mexicana Park. Back to you. I just, I just, I would like to add that, uh, contrary that the perception that you could have seeing these beautiful pictures, the park could get together all the segments in the society, the people, the more, the more people, the people who are poor in the area could visit the park. They don't have to pay anything. I mean, they can bring their food and spend time. In, in this beautiful park and share as an equal to the people who have more money in the area. For example, the skate park is beautiful because you can see a very poor guy who is very good with the skateboard teaching a, a John man who has a lot of money or living one of these buildings uh, how to skate in a proper way. So it could be an, a great social project that as Herman said, uh, took advantage of the generation of an economy and provide these with these resources opportunities uh, in an equal way to all the segments in the population. Uh, so this is the last picture I think we have from uh, La Mexicana and back to you Herman. And all you. right, so this next yeah. example, I think I know the guy there. It's a good friend. <laughs> Sometimes I see and stuff. Anyway, uh, well, we're going to speak about um, Parque Metropolitano de León, which is the park that I am honored to manage for, for some years now. Anyway, the, the takeaway from this park of how, what, how we see it organized, that can be an example for other parks, is actually the citizen part. It, this is an example of how a decentralized organism in, in a Latin American government, in a municipality specifically, can thrive through um, the collaboration of government, private, and, uh, and well, yeah, citizens and government. Our board is, com is comprised of about 10 citizens that they do not get paid. They do it just for the love for the park. I mean, this park is actually quite a, a big one. It's almost 370 hectares, which is uh, like, like we used to promote it is eight times the Vatican. So yeah, it's bigger than countries. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is also an example of how um, a circumstance of um, some hydraulic uh, infrastructure can be converted to become uh, a recreational park. In this case, uh, Presa del Palote, which is a, a, a regulatory dam, it was created back in the fifties in order to prevent the cities the city of Leon to, to, from flooding. I mean, we are in a, in a region in Mexico, it's in, in central Mexico, where uh, there is not a lot of rain, but when it rains, it rains a lot. So that's a common scenario around Latin America. I mean, we have really extreme weather and uh, we need a lot of water management, hydraulic management. In this case, this, this reservoir dam, which was huge in this uh, kind of semi-desertic area, was built in the 50s and it remained like that. People used it, but it was not in an organized way. So in the 90s, citizens, people that they wanted uh, this to become a park, they got organized, they got the support of the government and the park was built. 
And this park right now man, uh, receives more than almost 2 million people a year. And there is a lot of people that have great stories in the park and that we are able to manage uh, in a way that we conserve, that we preserve biodiversity. I mean, through the creation of the park, we have become one of the uh, natural hotspots for bird watching with over 200 species, which is really a great, great example of how to turn urban areas into sanctuaries for biodiversity. Scott Martin, I know that you and your girl are amazing uh, bird photographers. You're more than welcome to visit. Any of you that are watching, come visit Parque Metropolitano Leon. We have a lot of bird watching. But anyway, it has a, sus a sustainability model that right now is being migrating into the first uh, park systems in, in the area. So. That is what is going on in this part of Mexico. We are trying to evolve this organization that they are citizen uh, driven in order to reach other areas. So that is uh, pretty much one of the stories of Parque Metropolitano. And another story we would like to share is how to, uh, we have been investing in how to make uh, park, uh, park um, the people that work in parks to make it a profession. It's not just a matter of, well, I ended up here and I'm gonna do things in park that I could do anywhere else. Like for example, we have all our, our the people that they took care of security. Well, they were, pre they were pretty much security guards. They could be working in a shopping mall or they could be working in a school, but then we turned them into park rangers, which is something we had learned a lot from our neighbors up north. In North, in North America, you have great, great examples of uh, ranger programs. So we have been implementing these ranger programs and it's incredible to see how the people that you see in these pictures, they have found their call. They are no longer just uh, drifting between jobs. They have a career now and we have been uh, promoting them in order for, for them to become experts in terms of how to uh, manage nature and people all together. So this has been an amazing opportunity for now 15 rangers that we have. And it's a program that we are um, trying to replicate in other areas of the country, how to professionalize this amazing thing that it's uh, working in a park. So that is for Parque Metropolitano Leon. Next slide, Luis, I guess. Uh, it's yours I also. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you, Luis. So this next one, we're going to go a little bit north in uh, to Monterrey, Monterrey, Nuevo León, which is uh, pretty, pretty uh, close to Texas. You could say that this city is amazing, uh, not only in the geographical sense, but also in its nature and its people. I mean, it's really, really great people that that, that comprise the, the Monterey area. So Monterey has this gem in terms of park management that is called Fundidora Park. Another, uh, another example of uh, how, to how to do the most with what you have there. We're, we're speaking about an old steelworks factory that we was huge. I mean, it was one of the, the, of the, of the founding stones, I mean, of the, how Monterey became such a great industrialized city. It was steel, steelworks. So when this factory stopped working, they decided by in the 80s, 90s to turn it into a park. And this park, it preserves a lot of all these steelworks um, machinery and buildings, which make it also a cultural heritage area. But uh, what really stands out the most is the way that they have been managing it. I mean, this park is one of the few across Latin America that, it, that they do not depend on government subsidy from recent years. How do they manage that? Through three, um, three categories. One of them is parking lots. They give 33% of their budget through parking lots and they're really well managed parking lots. The second one is uh, events and all the programming. They they are they host one, uh, some of the biggest fe music festivals in in Mexico and even I could say like Latin America. They have been becoming bigger and bigger hosts of, of this of this festival. But they have a great program of how to not do them all at the same time. They can only do a few of them, like seven. I I I remember, but they do charge uh, what needs to, 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 to correspond to this, to the park. So they receive a lot of income from there. And the third one is through concessions. They have great um, 
great contracts, great alliances with commerces, because there is more than eight or nine million people that visit this park every single year. And also one of the main things, because it is a park that does not receive any subsidy from the government, it, it doesn't have an access fee as well. So it's a great example of how these kind of parks, they can thrive and they can have, they can become self-sustainable. I mean, look at the picture. It's a beautiful, beautiful park. And also it's a great example of how they manage the park so well that now they are running the park, the state, the state park system, which comp comprises of other areas that are way bigger than that. Like for example, the mountain range called Aguasteca and several others. Uh, and all that happened because of good management practices. Uh, Fernando Villarreal, who is a director Right now, it's a great man and uh, very interesting to talk to him in terms of how they achieve this model of self-sustainability. So that's for uh, Fundidora, Luis. Okay, uh, thank you, Herman. The next case is in Guayaquil, Ecuador. We just celebrate our conference, uh, South America conference over there last week, and we had a chance to uh, know in a presence way, but in a virtual way, uh, visit many, many of their beautiful uh, public spaces over there. And the one that I would like to share with you is the front, the waterfront in the this beautiful city, two million people city is I think the main, it's not the capital of Ecuador, but it's the financial capital of the of the of this beautiful country in South America. And it has this uh, beautiful construction uh, in the waterfront that create a complete different environment in terms of many, many good things from the people from Guayaquil. I would like to share with you on a video and since the video is uh, rolling out, I'm gonna uh, explain you a little bit about the project. So this, this video, we use it to show in the conference uh, all the attractive areas that this uh, case of study has. So uh, this uh, waterfront connects many areas in the city. Uh, and I think 20 years ago, create an, a unique uh, model uh, of governance and uh, economic model, and also uh, promoting many values in the community, the culture, the nightlife, the uh, obviously uh, things related to the uh, biodiversity, the environment, uh, a beautiful plazas connecting this uh, main economic area with this beautiful neighborhood, which is, uh, I think, the, the very, uh, pl the very uh, place that the, the city was uh, in the beginning, no found, but uh, populated. And this area connect with the Malecon dos Mil, which is pretty much the waterfront. And it, uh, the name, uh, the correct name is uh, related to the uh, Simon Bolivar, which is one of the most uh, important peoples in the history of, of America in terms of the uh, independence. So this is uh, the, the area that connects the uh, financial center with this beautiful neighborhood that I showed you before with this uh, fair area and with an entertainment uh, uh, activities for people, restaurants, beautiful trees, playgrounds, and uh, I think it's on a four or five kilometers long with uh, the connection of these other areas that I show you. And this changed the life of the people in Ecuador. They had to create these uh, peers from nothing. They uh, in, in some way gain uh, land or, or water from the water from, and they create these peers in order to establish all these uh, activities, programs, and uh, obviously amenities that the Malecon dos Mil has in Guayaquil. It has an, a shopping mall in, in this area that you just see, the restaurants and many, many other era, beautiful areas uh, in Guayaquil. So if you are planning to visit Ecuador, uh, definitely Guayaquil has not just this beautiful open space, but many others. This is the Crystal Palace and was designed by Eiffel, the guy who created the Eiffel Tower in, in France. So it's this is definitely a uh, destination park, a public space in South America. 
The other examples regarding the safety, as Herman said, is obviously Bogota. Bogota did an amazing job in the past uh, municipality administration. And it's, well, it has been an example in all area, how to manage and handle the, the public space in terms of many values that we can share with the people from Bogota and, and of course from Colombia. We have been learning a lot from them, also from Medellin and other cities in Colombia. And the past mayor, uh, uh, the, the Enrique Peñalosa mayor, uh, invests a lot of money uh, trying to change many things regarding the parks in the past administration. And one of the things that he uh, looked after was this uh, creation of uh, soccer fields. They had a chance to create more than 157 uh, soccer fields, first class world soccer field with synthetic stuff, beautiful scenarios with lighting. And they create this case regarding the same thing. And, and they published this study who was uh, created for those organizations that are in the, in the paper uh, that uh, proved this case about how these soccer fields and uh, the light in and the promoting of the nightlife with the sports and a sport like soccer, not just the soccer fields, but a lot of many others, uh, public spaces uh, in, in this period of time with Enrique Peñalosa uh, as a mayor. Uh, so they pass from this to have this in terms of uh, how many soccer fields or synthetic uh, turf soccer fields have in, in the city. And uh, they, had a chance to create this beautiful platform about sports and public life that benefit more than 8 million people in one year using these facilities. So this is some of the pictures that I got from Marta Carpintero. Uh, she's joining us in the uh, webinar from, from Bogota uh, to show us some of the examples that this beautiful city has been achieved in terms of the promotion of sports like soccer seed, but uh, as I said, there's not only, uh, or, or there was not only the, 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 the only action that they follow up in terms of promotion of public space that have a lot of other examples, but these cases regarding the safety and how they improve the safety in the city, promoting the sports and the soccer uh, in, in a specific. The other case is a beautiful case also, uh, it's from San Jose, Costa Rica. This guy, uh, Federico Cartin, promotes this beautiful uh, project. The name is uh, Rutas Naturbanas, in terms of a uh, translation, it's an uh, urban nature route. Uh, and they are trying to connect uh, in terms of many, many uh, values of the public space, inclusion, equity, biodiversity, uh, water management, a lot of, a lot of things through this beautiful project. So they are intended to connect the more uh, poor uh, neighborhoods with the more richest neighborhoods through this, uh, like, I'm, I'm gonna say this and don't, please don't misunderstand. It's like an, a, an a high line uh, project in New York that connect in a way, uh, I mean, this is an, a high, a structure, but in case of the of the high line, of course, but when we talk about Ruta Naturbanas, it's just in the middle of the mountains in San Jose. So people can cross over these elevated spaces and enjoy uh, by bicycle or by walking the nature, avoid the sounds of the city, connect with the public transportation and enjoy their public life. Here's some of the perspectives of the project. This is a reality right now. Uh, they have been covering, I think, two kilometers from 25 that they have to cover in the whole project. And uh, this is pretty much a perspective that uh, they are vision, uh, visionary in, in this uh, case of Ruta Naturbanas that allowed uh, San Jose to connect all the biodiversity and create these corridors uh, regarding the, you know, animal and, and, and vegetation uh, promotion and traffic of all these ecosystem uh, elements. 
so this is uh, Rutas Naturbanas from San Jose, Costa Rica. Uh, back to you, Herman. Thank you, Luis. And yeah, I guess that this is a perfect connection to talk about resilience and biodiversity. I mean, uh, Latin America is such an incredible region in terms of mega diverse countries. I mean, we have six of the 17 mega diverse countries in, in the world, and that means that there is a lot of biodiversity. However, I mean, if we say that we have six countries, you know, nature, they do not know borders like we humans do. I mean, those are political borders. However, uh, through park creation, and this is a great story that I'm going to speak about briefly about Argentina, and how a beautiful accident that happens whenever there is, uh, like they said, I mean, when you leave a space like that and you do nothing, nature happens. And this is a great example of how they, they made the most of it. I mean, this is the story of Parque del Bicentenario in Salta, Argentina, which uh, it's, a, it's an incredible place. I mean, Salta is in, is in Northern Argentina and it's quite a, a dry region. I mean, it has these multicolor mountains. It's a great, great region, but there's not a lot of water. So what happened that how Parque del Bicentenario was created is that in order to make a highway, yes, a highway for cars, they, uh, they had a quarry that where they took the material and they left a big holder. So what happened, nature happened. So uh, through rain and all the, the different uh, currencies from, from water in, uh, on rain, uh, a small lagoon began, began forming and people start noticing that. And then the government start noticing that. And here, uh, well, the, one of the main leaders of this project is Mariana Prone, a good friend that now she's the leader of Parques de Argentina, a great association that, that uh, well, uh, it's, uh, it's doing great job in, in, in South America in terms of, of uh, park awareness and management. But anyway, so uh, Mariana was, was talking, uh, was uh, telling me that how in the beginning, this natural area, it started to attract more birds and more uh, different frogs and different critters and everything. So people start getting there. And now it is great how in a couple of years, almost three years, it became a park and how it's become like a sanctuary for bird watching in Northern Argentina. This is something that uh, in Latin America, there is a lot of opportunity to do that. I mean, maybe city planning is, has not been the strong point in the last 50 years, but uh, people nowadays, I mean, all the, all the new generation and, and people that want public spaces, government, citizens, all these organization, they can make the most out of these beautiful accidents like happened here in, in South Argentina. Well, there is a lot of examples in Latin America and how through park management and park consolidation, they create a, such an educational environment for people to realize that we're part of an ecosystem, that we have an incredible biodiversity that we need to teach about it. We need to, uh, to make the most of it. So anyway, this is a, a small example that represents a lot of what's going on in Latin America right now, how we're uh, rescuing places in order to make biodiversity sanctuaries. And, and yeah, in the end, well, parks are, are for people, but they also are incredible for nature. And here in Salta, I uh, recommend it a lot if you get the chance to visit there to see everything that they have been doing in this e e educational uh, mission in order to how to create a natural area that gathers a lot of biodiversity. And at the same time, this beautiful accident has been saving downriver neighborhoods from flooding because it gathers water. <laughs> so anyway, this is a great example of how Latin America can adapt to creative and amazing people in order to create these places that they, uh, well, they provide all the benefits of, of our beautiful parks. So anyway, that's it for me, Luis. Thank you, Herman. I think this is the last but not the least uh, uh, important project that we would like to share with you. This is the Central Park in uh, city of Juarez. Juarez is an... Uh, desert city in the border with the states. It's, uh, it makes border with uh, uh, El Paso, Texas. And this uh, very beautiful city, which is because it's beautiful. I mean, it's very complicated and it gets a lot of problems like every uh, other city in the world. But the people from Juarez have been 
you know, struggling with uh, the promotion of a city uh, with all the problems that means being an uh, adjacent uh, neighbor from with the states and uh, suffer about migration and drugs and many other problems. So they have this beautiful park in the center of the city, which unfortunately crossed this uh, big avenue uh, between the two part of the parks. I would love to, to see in the future that we could uh, connect everything with a tunnel or with a hole and pass the traffic underground and has a connection with the park. But meantime, this uh, park uh, is going to, uh, is suffering right now and a transformation because his first approach was 30 years ago. And the part of the right, which is the, uh, yeah, the part of the right, I don't know how to explain in a different way, but it, it was administrated the first time, uh, I mean, many years ago, but the transportation commission in the city, and then they transferred the park, this, this part of the park to the police administration because it was just for the policeman, but the policeman didn't use it and the park suffered uh, many you know, bad things in the past. And this uh, governor decided to rescue the park and invest a lot of money. And they made like an uh, update of the master plan, which is also a project from Mario Shektan architect. And they create this resilient project Regarding all the beautiful areas in the park with the, uh, you know, uh, amenities with the cultural areas like the amphitheaters with the soccer fields or the baseball fields and many other features that they have park that the, the park has, they create an, a resilient project regarding this that Herman was talking about the, the water management and the problems that Ciudad Juarez could uh, face in the future. Uh, regarding the floating and the water. And this is the very uh, zone in the city that receive all the water when the rain really uh, comes to the city. So this, they create this uh, water project and, and I cannot use my pointer to show you, but there is this uh, area to, you know, cap the, the water in the, in the bottom of your screen in the right side, who received all, it has like eight or nine meters high uh, or elevate. I'm gonna show you in a second on a, a, a perspective of this and a, and, a, and a picture, but it's supposed to uh, help or to work as an, uh, a recollector for water. And then the baseball uh, fields are also like three or four meters above the natural level. So they use also the soccer fields as a part of this uh, water project to preserve the integrity of the city. So they have been, they have been building this amazing project to cap all the water in a possible, you know, very hard rain in the future and also uh, rebuild and a beautiful park. This is pretty much an, a picture of how high is this, like a dam. And the, in the center, you can see these systems to recollect the water. They're gonna have this uh, water mirror with uh, many programming things over there, like boats and many other things. And, uh, but the, the main uh, use of this space is to prevent and a disaster in the city. I'm gonna show you an uh, uh, animation of this in order to, to give you the, a, a more sense of the project. Here is the animation. So I can, I'm gonna, okay. So this is how high it's going to be. It's going to have this uh, area with a, a small pier to have the boats over there and to rent boats for people. Uh, there is an attract for bicycle and for for pedestrians or for running who has this beautiful sea about this like a dam or it's, it's on a yeah a recollector for water and uh, people are going to have the chance to in a desert area to get in contact with water which is 
very important also as a recreational uh, matter in the management of parks, as Kerman said. And also, it's going to create, of course, nature in the future. It's going to create more, you know, fishes and frogs and uh, birds and everything is going to reborn in a place who used to be on a hall without any use. So this is pretty much the Park Central project. And we would like to make reference to this area in particular because it's a resilient project for all the people from Juarez. Okay, I think we are done, uh, AP and Scott. We thank you uh, for your attention. And of course, at the end of the session, we are open to receive any feedback or comment or any questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Herman and Luis, uh, for showing us some great examples from Mexico and also other parts of Latin America. Absolutely uh, just beautiful and stunning uh, uses of open space for cities. And now, now I'd like to go uh, to our panelists, Evelyn and Rodrigo, if you could introduce yourselves and start your discussions about some uses of parks in our, in our society today, dealing with some of the issues that are pressing us. And we look forward to hearing from you. Hello, everyone. Um... I'm Evelyn Santos from UNOPS and not from UNOPS office in Brazil. And it's a pleasure to be here today sharing with you all. Uh, I don't know if Rodrigo would like to present himself now, but we're gonna share the this this presentation on our publication. Do you wanna present? Yes, thank you, Evelyn. Uh, I would also like to thank you, Scott and AP, for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, it's a bit hard to follow Herman and Louise with their amazing presentation, but we try our best to 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 make a good uh, time to have a good time together. Well, I'm Rodrigo. I'm talking from São Paulo, Brazil. I'm a member of the Instituto Semeia, an NGO that uh, is dedicated to make Brazilians proud of their parks, either urban parks or natural national parks. And uh, I think Evelyn will start the presentation. I will follow with some comments and some compliments. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to share my screen here. Is everything OK with the presentation? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Um, OK. So, yeah, like I said, I'm from the UNAPS office in Brazil. Uh, and we're going to present our publication, Parks for All, uh, Inspiring More Diverse Spaces Through the Gender Perspective. Uh, well, the publication was produced jointly uh, uh, by the United Nations Office for Project Services and the Semeia Institute. Uh, within the scope of a technical cooperation with the Porto Alegre city government. It was idealized with the objective of a structure and sustainable uh, operation model for the all of the Guaiba Park in the south of Brazil. Uh, we, count on, we also counted on uh, technical contributions from the UN women and UNAIDS offices in Brazil. Well, um, we all know the, the importance of urban parks in the lives of people from, from cities, you know, to uh, have a, a nature space and places for uh, le leisure and, uh, and rest from their busy routines. And regarding the implementation of parks, norms and rules are relevant and surely uh, they help uh, in the construction of the spaces. But it's, uh, it's necessary to remember that the, the human needs may not be uh, always fully covered by them. Uh, it is important to consider uh, social relationships and interactions between people. It's in this context that this publication presents a gender perspective, uh, considering how different types of people make use of parks. Uh, parks for all is a tool to inspire the construction of these more diverse spaces from the insertion of gender perspective and uh, in urban parks, 
uh, whether in their implementation or management. Uh, the publication brings guidelines, suggestions, and ideas to start thinking about parks that consider the needs of everyone. Um, the concept of gender uh, refers to the different roles, responsibilities, and social opportunities associated with male and female beings and their relationships. Uh, in the most societies, there are differences and inequalities between women and men uh, in assigned responsibilities, activities carried out, uh, access and control of resources, as well as uh, decision-making uh, opportunities. And providing uh, universal access to safe, inclusive, accessible, and green public uh, spaces means seeking innovations that eliminate these physical and symbolical barriers. Uh, this means inc incorporating uh, the inclusion of a gender perspective in a discussion about cities. Um, so uh, these guidelines and recommendations for urban parks uh, from a gender perspective, uh, they are based on dialogues uh, we had with regulars in the Olo de Guayba Park, uh, meetings with technicians from the government uh, and organized civil society, uh, as well as uh, bibliography regarding um, to the theme. Uh, they are aimed to encourage uh, gender mainstreaming at the, the time of implementation of, of parks, uh, from project design, execution, and evaluation, uh, as well as addressing the following dimensions that I'm going to, to further explain now. Well, uh, the first dimension is participation. It is very important to, uh, when thinking about those, those more uh, inclusive and diverse parks, to plan meetings with the locals uh, to debate their different reasons of the park, uh, as well as meetings with civil organizations that act in the surroundings to know their uh, expectations and interests regarding the park. And it's also very important to encourage uh, the access, existence of committees formed by members of civil society uh, to monitor the implementation. It's also central to provide public and accessible information to locals about decisions, construction, services, ensuring transparency and encouraging the uh, citizen oversight of the project. Uh, it is also very important to keep open communication channels with those people, uh, like emails and phone numbers and contact forms. Uh, the second dimension uh, talks about work and leadership. Uh, in, in here, uh, we, uh, the guidelines show that it's, it's very important to uh, ensure gender parity in the park management and diverse technical staff, like in both hired companies and park teams, um, as well as encouraging the, the, the application from socially excluded groups to any possible job vacancies. And it's also very important to promote the participation of uh, small business but led by women, Black people, people with disabilities, uh, uh, LGBTI plus people uh, in all the activities carried out in the park, like uh, craft fairs and uh, food festivals, music festivals, and others. And when talking about uh, spaces and equipment, some things to pay attention to. It's uh, that it's important to build playgrounds and courts uh, that include different ages and uh, support different uses. Like for example, without markings and structures uh, for just one uh, specific kind of sport practice. Uh, it's also uh, key to uh, install public, public toilets accessible to all free of charge with uh, spaces for changing diapers and other uh, children facilities, for example. Uh, it is important to have bicycle parkings as well and to build spaces uh, for people accompanying children, like for example, benches uh, in the shadow. And uh, another point that is important when thinking about those spaces is to think about uh, the different kind of people that use the, the park area as a workplace, like vendors, for example. So provide a work infrastructure with free drinking water points, storage spaces for belongings, shadow, and easily accessible uh, trash bins. 
Uh, the fourth dimension of our document uh, talks about services. How can we address uh, gender uh, in the services uh, offered in the park? Uh, it is very important to encourage small and medium-sized companies run uh, or mostly formed by women uh, in order to promote their economic empowerment and uh, move the local economy. It is also central to ensure support infrastructure for uh, any small and medium-sized companies uh, like in order to, to facilitate the movement and storage of goods and equipment uh, during events and all the services in the park. And another point that is essential, it is encouraging the variety of prices and the services uh, charged in the park area so that the um, so that they meet the different income realities of the locals. Um, and this information uh, must be uh, included in the contractual uh, instruments that rule the operation of the, the occupation of uh, these, these spaces. Um, the fifth dimension, uh, it's, it's also very important. Uh, it's something usually overlooked, but it's, it's also a point when we are uh, talking about a gender perspective, that is the language and symbolic representation. Uh, it is important to ensure that the iconographies used in the park visual communication are uh, diverse representations of men and women, and that uh, this representation reflects the diversity of the municipality, that the people uh, from the surroundings feel um, seen in those places, feel part of it, feel represented. Uh, it is also important to reserve spaces for awareness campaigns uh, against discrimination and violence uh, violence against women, um, Black people, uh, LGBTI plus groups, and other uh, excluded groups. Uh, and uh, it, it's still in, in between this um, symbolic uh, importance. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's uh, recommended to name uh, public places and squares uh, guaranteeing the diversity of the people honored, uh, bringing men and women, and making available in that public space information about the biography. So they are more known by people in, in this. Um, a, uh, another very important dimension when planning those parks, uh, and to take a, uh, to pay attention to the, the gender uh, perspective, it's it is mobility. Uh, regarding mobility, it is important to build uh, sidewalks, lar large si sidewalks that allow pedestrians, wheelchairs, people with uh, baby trolleys or shopping carts to walk simultaneously without any problems. Uh, it is important as well to uh, implement access ramps, benches, and seats along the way and to pay attention that those elements are not in the pedestrian way in order to, to have mobility, to have good mobility. Uh, it's also important to install, install, install signs and, of all access routes, equipments and services. And it's uh, very crucial to promote the integration of the park with the public transportation uh, stations uh, with broader and well-lit stops that ensure possibilities of always uh, to see and to be seen. Um, and uh, another point that is important as well is to insert barriers or control systems that prevent cars and motorcycles from invading pedestrian areas. Uh, this is it's another way of looking for not not only women needs but uh, but to take a closer look to something that it, it could importunate them as well. And uh, we could not talk about more inclusive parks for women without mentioning safety. That is one of the biggest problems. Um, and public lighting with uh, gender uh, equality means expanding lighting going beyond traffic lanes, including trails and sidewalks in the park and in the surrounding areas. 
it's also very important uh, to avoid that elements uh, of urban furniture uh, to prevent control, uh, visual control of the space. Uh, it's also it's uh, it's always very important to um, allow to see and to be visible. Um, another uh, essential point is to ensure periodic maintenance of green areas, preventing that the the growth of vegetation from creating blind spots and unsafe areas as well as um, mapping empty and abandoned areas and other places that may, may be a source of insecurity around the park. Uh, something that is also key uh, regarding safety is including the, the debate of uh, gender and diversity in the training uh, of the, the patrolling teams of the park, uh, as well as encouraging the diversity of these teams themselves. Um, and last dimension, but not least, evaluation. How can we uh, include the, the gender perspective to the evaluation of projects? It is important to collect and analyze information on, on the gender identity and the ethnic uh, racial belonging of the people who attend the park in order not, to only, uh, in order not only to profile the audience, but also to uh, identify possible issues. Like for example, only 10% of the, the people who attend the park are, are women. Like what could, what could be causing that and how can we address these problems? Um, it's also important to include as a criterion for hiring research companies, their expertise in working with the team and uh, provide data disaggregated by race and gender. Uh, Another key point as well is to conduct periodic evaluation of information uh, of complaints sent by the, the park's audience and to uh, regularly promote meetings uh, with, with these people that, that attend the parks uh, to produce collective assessments of the park facilities and services. Now I'm gonna let Rodrigo talk a bit more about the recommendation for partnerships in those parks. All right, thank you, Evelyn. Uh, I'll be very briefly here on, uh, on my presentation, but uh, I would like to start by saying that uh, I'm quite aware that this is not to talk about gender equity is not properly my locus of speech, but we do believe that this topic should be addressed for us all regardless of her gender, so we can achieve real changes on gender equity in our public spaces and in our society as a whole. So uh, I will discuss briefly how can we uh, apply those recommendations Evelyn just talked about when you are thinking about a partnership. And by partnership here, I mean uh, a contract, a long-term contract between the public administration and private entities. For example, either they're being not-for-profits, like the, some of the examples our colleagues from Mexico talked about earlier, like La Mexicana Park, but also uh, in partnerships with for-profit entities or for-profit companies. Uh, this is uh, a topic we have been developing in Brazil in the past years. We have some cases of for-profit uh, companies managing uh, public and free access public parks uh, with uh, very promising results. So I will talk uh, very briefly about uh, uh, the four stages of a project uh, life cycle. Uh, the first phase is a pre-evaluation phase and uh, is a phase when the public administration conduct a diagnosis of the area of the park and also set the guidelines that will be used in all the next phases of the project. Uh, the project structuring phase is the most complex phase of all life cycle. Oh, I'm sorry, Evelyn, could you come, go back? Yes, thank you. Uh, the, the project structuring phase is the most complex phase of all. Uh, in, in this phase where the public uh, administration conduct all the studies to create a master plan for the park, to create a facilities maintenance plan, and also the business plan uh, that will guide all the work uh, to come. Then we have the bidding 
process. Uh, in this phase, we select the private partner that will manage the park under the guidelines and the supervision of the public administration. Uh, is also in this phase we have all the official public hearings and public consultations. And later we have the contract management phase, uh, is the longest of all phases that uh, covers more uh, the, the biggest period of the project life cycle. Is it in this phase, uh, is the public administration responsibility together with the civil society to make sure that the private partner is fulfilling his duties and is properly managing the park. So now I will talk uh, with, about some recommendations in each of those phases. Uh, when we're talking about the pre-evaluation, when the government has an intention to make a partnership and to, uh, to improve the park's management, it's pretty important that the public, uh, the government team responsible for this project is representative uh, regarding gender, race, and other uh, and other diverse, diverse matters. It's also very important to map the main stakeholders in the region that work with this topic and hold workshops and meetings to raise awareness uh, regarding the topic. In the in the project structuring phase, it's also very important to hold meetings uh, to collect contributions for the project, thinking about gender equality especially with those stakeholders mapped before, and also conduct a training on the government group working on the project so they be aware of uh, gender equality matters and they can, uh, so they can fulfill their, uh, their duty considering this as well. In this phase, uh, I will not pass by all of it, but uh, I would just like to highlight that it's also important and when we think about performance indicators, like the tools that will uh, help the government to assess uh, if the private partner performance is being well done, that we also think about the performance indicators regarding gender and diversity in the park. Uh, and the next phase uh, in the bidding process is important that we conduct the public hearings and the public consultations but also that uh, we promote the participation of several groups and representatives on those meetings, on those consultations, and also that their contributions can be analyzed and if they benefit the project, that can also be incorporated in the project. To finish, uh, I would like to talk very briefly about con the contract management phase. Uh, in this phase, it's very important to bring the society together and make sure that all the obligations expected by the private partner are being fulfilled. So it's important to hold meetings to collect uh, impressions on stakeholders and with the public, and also monitor the compliance of this uh, private partner with uh, his or her obligations. And uh, well, I, I talked very briefly about it all, but uh, if I, I would like uh, to thank all of you for your time, uh, if you could move forward, please, Evelyn. Yes, uh, those are the links in the Semeya website, semeya.org.br. We have this material if you want to go briefly, uh, obviously more, more deep, if you want to go deep into these topics, deeper than what we have discussed today, we have translated uh, this, this document for Spanish. Unfortunately, we don't have it in English yet, but we hope to have it soon. And anyway, his, yeah, there are our contacts. If you have any doubts later, you can feel free to contact us and, and talk about this even more. Thank you all. Thank you, Rodrigo and uh, Evelyn. Again, Herman and Luis, this has just been really, really uh, fascinating and uh, seeing some of the great things that is going on. Um, we're going to spend the last 10 minutes here with our group and thank you everyone who is listening and part of the webinar. Uh, I know that you have been sending some questions in and I just want to facilitate some conversation uh, with our panelists and you for the next 10 minutes. So I want to kick it off by asking you a question touching on something that you've talked about, you know, as an observer, 
living in North America um, and observing the work that you do in North America, Central and South America, um, we sort of, Latin, uh, the, our Latin American partners seem to be very progressive on social issues, which is fantastic. Sometimes ahead of us here in uh, Canada and the United States, particularly the United States. When you talk about the, all of these great parks, um, as they're being designed, new parks are coming on. How do you feel that parks can contribute to really creating this inclusive society? So kind of what Evelyn was saying about being intentional with iconography and um, how we identify and say things. Uh, we have some discussions here about, for instance, should we be building gender neutral bathrooms? Um, do we want to use our park spaces as a way to help advance narratives? So are you finding in your countries that uh, there's a desire for parks to try to help with that messaging or perhaps the opposite? Do you feel that people uh, don't like it when uh, we start doing things like gender neutral bathrooms? So just kind of wanted to see what your perspectives were on that um, as you've got these great parks coming online. Evelyn, do you want to? Okay, Herman. Yeah, I just wanted to answer really quickly in my experience what what how how this matters. Uh, parks and public space in general, they are the they are the lab. <laughs> they are the way to experiment uh, new social habits. I mean, we lived it through the COVID pandemic. How people get to practice how to uh, wear masks, how to behave with other people, how to keep social distancing. If they don't get to practice that, parks are the perfect place in order for people to start rehearsing how to behave in a more inclusive society, how uh, we can educate people through the, how Evelyn and Rodrigo said it. I mean, how can we uh, make that all our infrastructure actually encourages these kind of practices? Parks are the perfect places in order for a society to evolve into more inclusive practices. We have been seeing that in my park, in the park that I manage, of course. And, uh, and yeah, you need to take risks because of course, if you make a gender neutral bathroom, the, the first person that gets all the heat, it's uh, are the management, right? Or is the board, but you need to take risks for that. I mean, uh, it, it's worth it. We just made, I mean, and he's not really uh, an example for this, but we just made a park that was for 30 years, uh, you couldn't bring your pet. We made it pet friendly. It, it's a really small change, but we got a lot of heat for that. The first six months, they were hell from all the people that didn't want that. Three years after that, people are used to that and they knew how, and they now know how to behave with pets. And this is just a small thing. Regarding tolerance and inclusiveness, we need to take these risks. I mean, this is a call for every park manager out there. Take these risks. I mean, they are well funded by these organizations like UNOPS that they know what they're doing. So anyway, that's my, my participation. Yes, uh, I believe we are living in a very divided world these days uh, in Latin America, but perhaps in, in the whole world. So every time someone tries to, to make a move for a more progressive and inclusive space, uh, uh, we find resistance. And Hermara said it uh, wonderfully, you, as a park manager, you, uh, you must take some risks to, to provide a better park. Because I'll give you an example, while I was working in the city of Porto Alegre, uh, we heard some cases of women that couldn't go to the park because they have like a seven-year-old son. And she couldn't go to the toilet, uh, to the restroom with his, uh, with his children or her children because uh, it wasn't accepted. So one of the recommendations we have produced on, on this guide and we have seen in several projects is to produce, uh, is to create family uh, restrooms, fa family bedrooms where parents can go with their children so they cannot, they, they don't need to worry with the children going alone to the bathroom. And this creates a more inclusive place, a place where people feel like at home and can go and, and trust they will have a, a wonderful time. So it, it's not an easy task, but uh, we've seen some progress. I, I'm very 
positive about the changes we are about to see in the for coming years. That's fantastic. Um, wanted to ask a question that, uh, you know, you've all shown some amazing parks, uh, park projects and new parks. I think anybody in the park profession, um, we always have this fear that we're going to build these beautiful parks and no one's going to use them. Um, again, talking about access and the use of public spaces. We were joking, uh, the panelists, before we started that uh, sometimes in our Latino culture, we were raised by our parents, you know, don't touch this, uh, don't sit on the couch, don't mess up the pillows, <laughs> don't step on the grass. Um, just kind of jokes of, of how, our, how our parents and, and elders raise us. But uh, do you find that people are using the parks uh, in a way that they're intended for? So um, are they really using the parks um, and are they serving as models to continue investing you know in all parts of the of the city um, I'm just curious how that how that is going in in your park systems uh, I, I would like to say that uh, no in most of the cases because uh, if we are talking about great, large parks maybe or medium parks maybe they have more chances to be uh, because of the money or the importance that they play as a, as a part or as, a, as a, a key role in the city could have an, a participation or a participatory design process. But in most areas and because of the, I think it's, it's a lack of continuity in our political process. Uh, for example, in Mexico, the uh, one mayor just can uh, stayed in the office for six years at the most with one re-election period and that's it they have to wait three more years in order to apply for again for the office so if you don't have any continue uh, process uh, the times runs very quickly and you have to spend the money and you have to create parts very quickly because it's part of the political offer in most of the cases in for example in mexico so we have many, uh, mostly neighborhood parks, building or creating without any uh, public participation process. So in many cases, people react in a bad way and refuse to accept the park because they don't participate or they didn't participate in the process. And we, at the same time, we have this bad use of materials and bad quality of the products who are cutting the uh, life expectancy of the materials in the park and the, that avoid us to create and a good process also. So there's many factors. I think we have, as uh, Guillermo said, in, uh, Gil said in, in, in his conference, in the conference in Guayaquil, uh, in the Congress in Guayaquil, we have like an, uh, small examples in Latin America uh, that, provi that provide us, uh, as Herman said, uh, and a uh, reality that these kind of actions works, but we need to create an, a very strong movement in Latin America to you know, get to the right people and the, uh, the people who have the ability to, to make the decisions in the city in order to change all the narrative, not just in, in the inclusion or in the gender perspective design process, but in the whole values of the public space. I think this is my, my opinion. Fantastic. Well, I, I think this is a good area to end, but I do want to comment on that point. And I think that all of us can relate. There are some really, there are some uh, very positive things, uh, and you spoke about it, about the sort of the government action in Latin America, and it works both ways. I think when, when we observe uh, Latin America from North America down, uh, sometimes decisions can be made uh, quickly because there is this uh, concentrated sense of power, and it can be good and bad. In other words, um, the government can say, we want this project, we want this park and all of a sudden it's being done and things are being moved, but then these amazing spaces get built and the community feels like they weren't involved, right? 
Um, and I think that that is what Evelyn's presentation was about. And I think that that was what Luis was speaking about, that it's really important for us as park planners, because again, the worst thing is to build this amazing park. And sometimes the politicians think this is gonna be fantastic, just, just do it, but then nobody comes and it's not really uh, inclusive and accessible. So it's our job to make sure that we are bringing people along in the process so that we build them something that, as Rodrigo said, that has the right you know, bathrooms or that people can feel safe and lighting. So really super important. Thank you so much for uh, um, opening our eyes and uh, giving us some information. And I'm gonna have Scott just end us out here. Yeah, I, I'll just pick that up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, speakers. This was so inspiring. Evelyn, Rodrigo, so nice to have new voices, new experiences shared with our community. Thank you for making time. Um, so grateful for your, for your time, your commitment. Um, I'll, 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 re I'll reflect on a couple things and I will shut up. Um, when you look at Latin America, I can't help but as a North American uh, Anglo to see reflections of what Frederick Law Olmsted and many park builders were doing in our nation in the 1880s when our cities were going through urbanization. Um, you're living in an era that, that we either got right or we blew horrendously. And I can't help but think that with the exploding cities in Latin America, you have the opportunity to do some great things and learn from our mistakes. And I applaud and encourage and so inspired by some of those images. Uh, and Luis, what you're doing on the software side to build the profession, thank you for that. Um, you're building the people and the competency to do these things. And, and thank you, that's that's bold work you do, man. Uh, we really appreciate you and, and stand behind you uh, 100%. And finally, before I get too, uh, too churchy on you all, um, you probably hear the birds in the background and, and it always does. Uh, it reminds me because the birds here now are, are actually South American birds. Um, in North America, we get these guys, they, they just showed up here in my community. They're here two or three months a year. They lay their eggs and raise their young, but they're really your birds. And, and we share them with you. Um, we are so united um, in more ways than we can even imagine, which is much different than Africa and Europe and any other part of the globe. Uh, North America and South America are so ecologically united uh, by these little flying critters. Um, so it just inspires me to do our work together uh, because they depend on Herman and me to survive. So thank you for uniting us and reminding us how much we have in common. Uh, thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, if you if you have tuned in and you want to get these PowerPoints and all this, you're going to get them from Indiana University. You'll get an email afterwards that'll have all this stuff in it. And we thank Epley and Mason and all of our colleagues up there. So thank you all for taking your lunch or your breakfast or your dinner. I don't even know what time it is for some of our friends in South Africa um, for making this. And we will see you later on this month on the 25th where we talk about the art of rock and roll and the Blues Brothers and how they can come into parks and make things sing uh, literally and figuratively. So thank you all and thank you, AP. Appreciate all y'all. You're the best.